found stage right, growing new plays in Devon and Cornwall. By Candlelight by James Pickthall This is a favourite blanket. Some years old, but it appears to be holding its own. I can remember to the fine details how we got hold of it too. Garden centre, sunny morning. Khaki shorts and sailing shoes. That, that were me, I mean. Evelyn had on a mint green Breton shirt. It was quarter to ten and the lady who served us at the checkout, her nose was swelling from her nasal piercing. And this blanket was £8.50. And I had the exact change. I liked it because it was bright and cheery. Still do. The colours haven't faded. See here, this, this patchwork effect with the rainbow tiles. Oh, they've held up marvellously. Evelyn really took to it because it was firm, because you could easily, and with violent force, grab opposite ends and wrench hard. It wouldn't do any damage. It's sheep wool, she explained. Great for this summer weather. Just as useful in the winter. She's taken to doing this recently, having it laid out across the chair here. It goes like this. Blanket on first. There. Making sure it's, it's neat and tidy. She can tell the difference, especially if it's been aired or not. Then we need the pillow. There's a, a pillow now. Oh. <clears throat> Well, not, not a pillow, a, a cushion, that's what I mean. Again, one of hers. She used to have a love for butterflies and... Uh, I'll have to make sure I hide this from Nigel before he comes again, with his cardboard boxes. Even today was down my neck, about trying to get this house back in order. He told me that according to several articles he'd found on the internet, I technically classify as a hoarder. I said... In what world is this something to say to your own brother? He said, there's a crucial difference between ornaments and treasures. It's about function. Since when was it a crime to keep lots of things well organised? He said all he wanted to do was help. Bobby, you have to honestly think what a 72-year-old widower is going to do with a big empty house full of non-essential items. I said I wasn't in a position to talk about it. He said he was going to pop around this morning. Then I get a text from him saying that something else has cropped up. Now, I've no clue what's happening in the mornings, and now I'm in limbo, and that's why it's quarter to twelve now, and I'm only just getting to bed. Kept having to wash my hands all evening. It was greatly startling at first. But at the same time, highly settling. I thought it was that extra glass of lemonade I had when I was over at Joan and Henry's. I got up in an awkward rush and relieved myself. Coming back into the room, there's Evelyn, by the window, just looking out across the road. My feet were frozen. I couldn't move, I swear. They felt cold. That's what made me worried at first. I thought I was having an unfortunate wet dream, as in the ones older gentlemen get. She was there, in a dressing gown and reading glasses, glowing. I, I wanted to say something, but before I have a chance to find the word, she turns her head, like that of an owl. Our eyes meet, but she wasn't smiling or, or anything. She was just Evelyn, here, in our bedroom, looking out of the window. She looks back across the road and, just as I'm starting to get feeling back into my toes, she says, It would have been nice if they got an actual gardener to sort out the hedging out on their lawn. I said, whose lawn? Joan and Henry's. It's a good thing neither of them are hairdressers. That's all we need. To be friends with Sweeney Todd and Mrs. Lovett. <laughs> they did a pie for dinner, funnily, I said. I don't remember much about what happened after that. It was all foggy and... 
I woke up rather late in the morning and on the chair here was this old blanket and Evelyn's old cushion. This cushion looks a, a little flat. We've had this chair for as long as we've had the house. Never in retired, she found real joy in waking up early, making us both a brew, then coming back up and sitting in this little chair. Around the springtime, she'd wake up early, just to creak up open the window touch and, and listen to the dawn chorus as the morning light filled the room. I was mostly asleep. So I've started making an effort, just in the evenings instead. I'll, I'll come up here, turn everything off downstairs and, and listen to the evening song. All the birds that assemble like children's choir before they slip off into their dells and dream the night away. The other night she was here, had her head leaning to the side. She looked quite uncomfortable. She said her ear was full of water for some reason. I offered to fetch a square of toilet roll and she laughed and said, What a fat lot of good that's going to do! I think it was because I'm still thinking the way I was, helping, caring. She was doing wonderfully until the last couple of months. When she moved out, that's when Nigel started talking to me about getting things organised. I said to him, Nigel, you know that I'm always organised. Who was it who had to do your bag every morning before school? He said, this isn't us playing children games, Bobby. Don't make stupid comments. It was all right the first day he was here, but then he kept leaving mug stains around the house. What you need to do is start going through every room in the house and with careful attention, make piles of things to keep, things to dump and things to donate, he ordered. Started in here, in the bedroom of all places. I tried to argue that this was the room I was most comfortable with. I was able to pile up a lot of brochures and pamphlets and books of doctors and nurses and carers had provided. I find slogans haunting. How to make something as diverse and wild as human behaviour to, to sum it up with a jingle and a rhyme? It, but I guess something like be clear on cancer isn't really the same as a bottle of fairy liquid though, is it? Nigel was rummaging through the dining room and was organising everything into piles that he didn't himself specify, and I... And I will be perfectly honest, yes, I did lose my temper and I did use some rude language. I think at that point, however, he, he was a lot more understanding. Now, it's been a while, you see. So he's been getting restless. He at least tried to put everything back, but... I had to do it myself, just to be sure. Some things were terribly dusty, I must... must say. Had to keep washing my hands. She asked... Oh, sorry, uh, Joan did, when uh, I, I was at theirs the other day, regarding how I was doing and such. Soldiering on, I said. Joan remarked on the fact that I looked tired not getting enough sleep. She was nice. She offered to help with anything, but I told her, I said to her, Joan, it's honestly not a problem, I feel. Come to think of it, uh, I couldn't put into words how I was feeling at the time. It's been a bit of a bother recently, because, see, I'm, I'm not one for words. Evelyn knows words. She used to take minutes at the local council meetings. I should read some of the books of hers. It's still here, her little, little library. <coughs> now, I mentioned this to her the other evening, actually. Judge a person by the bookcase. And what do I have? I've, I've got books on Tai Chi. I mean, when was I into that? It must have been about 20 years ago. That's when we were trying to move house, I remember that. Not that the two were in any way connected. Uh, 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 old fiction, that was her things. Tom Jones, there's one I've never read. Persuasion, nope. Never read any Jane Austen, or... Uh, oh, this is her bookmark. I think so. 
don't know when she got this. Had she always it maybe well hopefully she's already <laughs> she's already read this one <laughs> oh it's fine it's fine i can easily ask her <sighs> she'll come about and I, uh, I can ask her and she can reassure me and if she didn't, then then I'll ask her if I can finish it. Maybe I can tell her what happens if I can understand what the what's going on. I don't try to ask her many questions. It's a bit rude and honestly rather steep of demand at such a, a difficult time of day. Uh, and I mean deep questions. That's what I mean. Not so much questions like. What's the capital of Luxembourg or anything trivial? But I wouldn't ask her any questions that might offend or, or confuse. When we were courting, this was about 50 years ago, almost, I, I took her to the county fair. I was used to trying to find things to do, so we just let each other guide ourselves about. We came up to the fortune teller's tent. She thought it'd be a laugh to give it a go, rather bizarrely. I couldn't bring myself to go in. I remember her asking me what the problem was. I said, well, suppose I'm told my future. What am I supposed to do if, if something goes wrong? Killed two birds that day. First, found out that I shouldn't get into philosophy with Evelyn. And second, I realised that fortune tellers aren't exactly specific or accurate in their prognostications. Evelyn went first. I waited outside the tent and almost got a child's balloon in the face. And when she came out, she was beet red and all giddy. What an enlightening experience, she pondered. Apparently, I am soon to find myself in good fortune by a shadowy figure in the middle of the day. He'll be frightening at first, but I'll soon find comfort in what he brings. I rolled my eyes and took a fifty pence piece out of my wallet. Remember the inside of this tent being rather dark. It smelled like the stuff my mum used to put in her hair before she went to work. And there was the fortune teller. Young woman, picking at her teeth. I remember her words of wisdom. According to her sources, whatever they were, I was to enjoy a gentle life, devoid any major turns. The twist, however was that at one point in my life I was going to find inner peace. She said, you'll be alone, resting by candlelight, and you won't notice it at first, but very soon you will begin to notice a change within you, and you will make that change. Outside, Evelyn's talking to a friend who's also come out with the day. She comes back up to, so, what was the verdict? I said, it's just a bit of harmless fun, isn't it? I was, see... I was under the assumption that it was like time travel. You'd be handed over a piece of paper that listed every achievement and failure you will ever encounter. Silly, isn't it? Very silly indeed. Still, not sure what Evelyn's fortune meant either. I hope Nigel doesn't come around. I'm not telling about Evelyn's little visits either. That'll be the end of me in this house our house the other week he said that i was starting to fall apart me his older brother i'm falling apart apparently i mean it's not like i'm in the corner of the living room wilting away crying my eyes out every day am i she's perfectly fine sitting in that chair she's happy and me i feel Fly Girl by Tanya Amsel To fly is the ability to move through the air with wings. Growing up, I heard of all manner of things that can fly. Most children hear about flying birds in storybooks or insects turning into butterflies or 
bats flying in the dead of night, but my fascination started with aeroplanes. I suppose it was built into me. Seeing that I was born 8,000 feet in the sky in the back of a Douglas DC-3 plane, mid-flight over the Mackenzie Mountains, determined not to miss another chance to be in the air. According to my mum, I didn't start crying until we landed on the ground. And you could say I spent the next 20 years concentrating solely on getting off the ground and seeing the skies again. And now I am not just a pilot. I am a <clears throat> search and rescue pilot. <laughs> and so I should have been happy when I got the call at 5am this morning, putting me on my 100th cargo trip. On the same plane, in fact, that I was conceived in. Interrupting my rather strange dream about a Mountie policewoman riding a caribou and asking me to come with her. Which is when I then woke up to go fly a fossil record plane. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, I love old things. Always have. The old trinkets that my mum would keep in a little box or the wicker chair that squeaked when anyone would sit in it to this aeroplane, a DC-3. In 1939, when Canadians officially joined World War II, Donald Douglas was inventing a plane that would be the first to fly coast to coast from LA to New York. But instead, together him and Arthur Raymond invented the first aeroplane that weighed lighter than the cargo it was carrying, and was so big it could sleep at least 14 soldiers as it crossed the Atlantic Ocean. My granddad was one of the first pilots to fly one all the way to Norway. And today, I am flying the same plane! <laughs> okay, not the same one my granddad flew because he got shot down, but it is pretty... Well, I was gonna say... Awesome! <laughs> you know, every time I fly this dinosaur, I have about 30 seconds of amazement that I'm following in my ancestors' footsteps. Which is quickly followed by utter terror at the fact that this plane still stands, well, flies, 85 years later. Well, most of the time. Uh, this is Flight 117. My name is Mac Atelier from Search and Rescue to the Control Tower. We seem to have lost power in engine one, so we're sort of pumping up air here. We're still a good 20 miles out of Yellowknife. I don't think we'll make it. We are approaching Great Slave Lake though, so... Yep. Yes, I think you know what I'm gonna suggest. <laughs> oh. Yellowknife is the capital city of the Northwest Territories in Canada, and my home. It can get pretty cold up here. Right now, it's minus 31 degrees. So landing on Great Slave Lake might not seem like such a big deal. I mean, lakes freeze, sure, but this lake is about the same size as Belgium in Europe. So I'm not sure how much it can take. And you're sure the ice can hold us? It's one of the deepest lakes in the world, so... Okay, okay, I'm just checking, cause we are coming down. Yep, definitely not gonna make it back to the runway. Yes, I know what I'm doing. I've done this at least three or four times before. Well, three, yes. No, no, I don't count the time I crashed. <laughs> My dad always used to call landing a plane on the ice the sweet spot. <laughs> you have to catch the wind, time the speed exactly right because you just keep going. You can't break, you just glide along the ice until you stop. My new co-pilot, Dev, has just joined the team after getting his license back home in India. He's a probie 
meaning trainee, and I'm gonna say he's even more inexperienced than most because before landing in Yellowknife, Dev had never even seen snow before, and today has gone from praising the DC-3 to hyperventilating one. <sighs> okay. Okay, Dev, just breathe into the paper bag, all right? You'll be fine. In fact, you know you'll be a lot better if you can read out the landing numbers to me. You can be sick when we... we land. Okay? Okay. Here we go. In the winter, Great Slave Lake is used as a motorway. Cars swiveling their tires across the ice and fishing, it is one of the deepest lakes in the world. Huts can be seen in certain spots with long fishing hooks to get below the ice layers and now an impromptu runway, landing slap bang in the middle of the lake, miles and miles from anything and anyone. I don't know what I was expecting to see when we landed on the ice, but one thing I did not expect was a dead body. <laughs> okay, we landed. Woo! Oh, okay. I thought you were going to give us a cheer then. <clears throat> Never mind. Um, we made it to the ground ice all unscathed, though I had to come down pretty sharpish, so we're in the middle of the lake and it, it's pretty cold. I've got the generator going on the engine so it doesn't freeze over, but if we can get a car out here pretty fast, that would be fun to... Okay. Dev? Dev, where are you going? You can't leave the plane, you'll get lost. Ugh. What are you pointing at? What is that? Getting lost in the snow can be a fairly common occurrence. The snow plays tricks on you. Your eyes become deluded into thinking you can see things. <laughs> like a mirage. The Inuit people have baffled us with their ability to navigate through snowstorms or sea ice. Basically, to any Western eye, they can find their way through indistinguishable landscapes and yet don't even have a word for navigating their vocabulary. <laughs> One of my dad's friends, Apoot Kanuk, is a Inuit and a descendant of one of the oldest ancestry families known as the Dene to still live in Yellowknife. When I was a kid, he used to explain how they called it wayfinding. Me and his daughter Petra would be told to sit outside the family igloo and look and listen intently at the outdoors, as though it were a symphony merging land and ice into one. I'll be honest... I just remember feeling very cold, but Petra would be able to describe if she heard the difference between snow drifting or flooring snow, meaning snow had fallen on the igloo. Looking back now, I'm not sure how much she actually knew, or if she was just trying to impress her incredibly gullible friend. It is no surprise that they have 100 words for snow alone. But what is surprising is that the dead body, which is sitting cross-legged, frozen solid, is an Inuit male. I believe it has to be a crime. How would anyone end about here in the middle of a humongous lake? And for an Inuit, it is nigh on impossible for them to get lost. It goes against all of their instincts. So, <clears throat> I called in the cavalry. <laughs> who called in, well, let's just say when I made the call, I don't think Dev screaming behind me helped matters. Okay, when I was saying about it being a murder, I mean, I was 
slightly exaggerating, but I still think it is most likely the cause of death. I mean, have you seen the gashes on his hands and fingers? Like, what is that about? But, um, <laughs> apart from that, uh, and him being an Inuit, I can't see anything else to suggest anyone else was involved at this point, so... So, oh, I'm sorry, you have gone to such great lengths here, but, um, if the medics have a minute, I don't think Deb has quite recovered from our landing. I have told him he maybe should have thought about that before becoming a search and rescue pilot, but then he saw this body, so now he's really had a day of it. I'm sure he could do with a hot chocolate. After the Mounties and the medics had made their assessments, it was decided to take the body back to Yellowknife and wait for it to defrost before identifying him. <sighs> Mountie Officer Pascal, the one I was dreaming about last night, offered us a lift back to town. You'd think after just landing a plane I wouldn't be squeamish on the ice and with a gorgeous woman sat next to me I'd be able to play it cool, but... <sighs> Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! This is a uh, surprisingly um, windy driving. Ooh, that is a bend. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. So... Your forensic man didn't seem to think much of the injuries, but I thought they were pretty deep. Oh, that was quite a swerve there. Did I say I thought I recognised him? Uh, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, my point was, if... Well, when you do find out his identity, do you feel like you'd be able to share it with anyone? Well, not anyone. Me? <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. Not that I don't like it when you smile at me, because, um, <clears throat> I have to say, uh, you have a beautiful smile, but, uh, can you keep your eyes on the... No, oh, uh, I, I was going to say road then. Look, I'm going to keep quiet now, because this is freaking me out a bit too much. <clears throat> Only, can I ask you? Do you ride reindeer at all? Is that a thing? No, no reason, just... I think you'd look good on top of a reindeer. Okay, I'm shutting up now. If there is one thing I hate more than being wrong, it's being right. It didn't take long to identify the body as Apoot Kanuk, my dad's old friend. Our surname is Atelier, in French meaning to land, which my dad joked about a lot because according to Apoot, if there was one thing my dad never wanted to do was to stop flying. <laughs> My dad was a simple man. He had a tiny airstrip, three planes that used to deliver cargo to the much smaller Northwestern Territory towns. He had the most friends in the world and not a penny to his name. <laughs> I used to help after school keeping the books when I was 15 and he gave me a job to do that and fly planes whenever I wanted. <clears throat> I honestly could have done this forever and I would have been perfectly content with my life if it hadn't been for the fact that when my dad went on a routine insulin run to Inuvik and never came back, him nor his plane. Retracing the route became the habit of so many pilots, including myself and Apoot travelled hundreds of miles by foot to search for him, knowing the terrain better than anyone. That was... 11 years ago now? They never did find him. But you could say that is why, after I graduated, I became a... search and rescue pilot, in the hopes of finding people's loved ones. Apoot was the same as my dad. He lived for the outdoors, the lake, the fishing. 
I asked Pascal if I could go with her to tell Petra, who, whose eyes were the size of golf balls even before we'd opened the door. And she broke down in my arms when we started to ask her questions. All we could get out of her was how much her father loved that lake. It was his family. Great Slave Lake is named after the Dene indigenous tribe, who were renamed slavery by their rivals, the Cree people who wanted to impress the French when they arrived in 1608, that they were superior. I relayed this all to Pascal in the pub after we left Petra, though I'm not sure if she was listening. Word had spread fast around Yellowknife and so pretty much everyone was discussing a poot. I know it's the unpopular opinion round here, but I'm sticking to murder. I mean, someone must have had an axe to grind with him over, over a, fish, a, a fishing thing. Uh, or, oh, I don't know. Oh, I know, Pascal. You never know what's going on in someone's head. I mean, I wish I knew what was going on in your head sometimes. Wait, did I say that out loud? <laughs> I would have stuck around longer, but a bar fight broke out and she pretty much kung fu'd two guys to the floor. <sighs> you know, it might have been for my slightly tipsy state as to why I didn't head home, but to the harbour and a poot's fishing boats, where I found glass smashed, spots of blood, and a tearful Petra. She pretty much spilled the beans straight away. A poot had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and she had booked him into a home down in Alberta. <laughs> to say he didn't want to go was an understatement. And Petra explained through sobs that the last few weeks he had tried to escape and so she had locked him into his boathouse, only for him to break the glass and escape walking out onto the lake. She... She uh, cried at the thought of him being confused and scared as he lay on the icy ground. <clears throat> I headed to the Mountie police station with Petra first thing, only they already knew the answer, having managed to finally prise open a poot's pockets to find a poem he had written. I think over again my small adventures. My fears. Those small ones that seemed so big. For all the vital things I had to get and to reach. And yet there is only one great thing. The only thing. To live to see the great day that dawns and the light that fills the world. Uh, so you see, Dev, he just wanted to be on his land, his lake. <laughs> Petra said he always wanted to be buried in Great Slave, but he couldn't wait for it to thaw, so he chose his own way out. <laughs> and it was all down to you for finding him. Maybe that means we need to have more landings on the lake? What do you think? Oh, I'm loving your enthusiasm, Dev. <laughs> you know, we could try right now if you like. It's good training, though I have got a date tonight, so I don't want any crashing. <laughs> oh, you do realise I was joking, right? Dev. Ugh, there's a paper bag in my hold all if you need it, by the way. No Home for a Kraken by Charlie Turnbull Once a month, there's this mum's writing group at the library, and I never usually have anything to share. But my son wanted this colossal squid 
for his birthday. And when it arrived, I thought, I can use this. This poor squid, I thought, 420 metres above sea level, landlocked in plush tangerine fur. And while I'm buttering toast, I tell the boy that there was this article I read in the local paper about finding tiny remains of sea creatures here on the moor and how we would all have been under the sea in Cretaceous times, but how it must have been a thin, revealing sea, not a dark, forgiving one. No home for a kraken. But then I look at his pale face and think, oh, what have I done? Sometimes... I wonder if the other mothers are only there to fill time. They write such lovely stories about their husbands and children and the spring and the autumn and a bird they once saw. Whereas I begin, <clears throat> This deep sea predator is an ambusher in more ways than one. It is so soft, though, this toy. Soft and giving everywhere. It travels by mantle and fin. The rest just trails behind. So despite its mature heft, it is weightless and dreamy in water. It's so soft that my son's incredibly disappointed. Apparently, the tentacles should have hooks to stop things drifting away to pull things closer in. I can use this, I thought. I can use the two antennae that he's always telling me are mistaken for tentacles. What's the difference, I think? Who cares? They stretch out, you know, all around the flat. They're always wherever I'm standing, and it's only a one bed, so if I move an inch, there are just another seven to trip over. And then when you add on the antennae, etc. But he cares. So, of course, we look it up. We run through the facts, maybe three to forty times a day. And, oh, I can use this, I think. As he complains, there is no beak where its beak should be, only the nylon sheath for your hand to go in. And while I struggle to think of this limp, orange puppet as anything other than starving to death without its evolutionary earned beak, I read about abysmal giganticism and how the females are so much bigger than the males. And I do one of those exhales where the front of your own hair stands on end. <sighs> because, oh, I realise I can definitely use this. It hides in plain sight. Its camouflage is the bioluminescence, the sparkle that draws us in.
Today I palpitate life into this feeble, beakless moor for nigh on two hours just to get him into the car. And we're always late. And they're always understanding. And I'd leave the damn toy in the class with him, but the rest of them see it. Still on my hand, tentacles swinging sadly. And don't children have their own weird antennae for the salty tug of pathos? Because they gather around. And he hates people near him. So I stuff it up my jumper like the world's meanest clown with half of that bloody writing group watching me. And I'm thinking, well, should I use this? It takes advantage of a natural instinct to pursue the unexpected and mysterious. At night, my boy sleeps where his father once slept, flinging himself around, whipping me with the slender, flexible limbs I gave him. Do I want to use this? I wipe water from his brow as he wakes over and over. Can you hear it? He weeps. And if I listen close above all the crying, can I hear it? Dragging itself across the outcrops. Crushing gorse. Gripping granite. Pricked by the anemone stings of the pines finding us gritted and wet as a seabed, gasping for breath nonetheless. Don't worry, sweetie, I say. The threat was never the kraken. It was being dragged into the whirlpool the kraken leaves behind. The gargantuan hook impales a cherry red little tyke's car in the garden and Oh, what have I done? To know it fully, you'd have to follow it down. Choose the hooks, except it's a mobilizing embrace. I don't think they like me, these other mothers. They write controlled, precise sentences, beginning with the firm proclamation of capital letters and ending with the deep breath of a full stop. We line up on grey, plastic, children-sized chairs in the library and they stare down at my flailing motives and analogies. Punctuation drowning in frenzied gulps of words. The group turns away when I say that Kraken was originally a catch-all, used to describe all the many monsters of the sea, for fear that speaking their true names might summon them. I hide the rest of these notes, written on the back of an NHS outpatient's appointment letter in my bag, out of sight. Because there are tentacles here, looping under and back again and again until, look, a knot around my neck. The hooks are drawing blood if someone could just show me which ones are the antennae, perhaps... Could I use this? But wait! Oh! Oh! When did it get a beak? Let it hold you fast in the awful, glittering black. I'm sorry. Lucy Long. Cannot take your call right now. 
Please leave a message after the tone. This is a message for Miss Long. Dr. Harris was expecting to see you. No. He's asked me to see if I can get a hold of you, so I'll keep trying you. The number here is 01837-658. Rocks by Neil Beber. The boat stopped coming a while back. And not long after that, the lights went out too. Apart from the one up there, which is designed to still be working long after all of us are gone. Which might not be long. I've been having bad dreams. I think they're dreams anyway. Or memories, or some strange hybrid of the two. Either way, I wake up with an underlying sense of dread. That soon fades when I realise none of it can hurt me now. Can you see that? It's probably hard in this light, but you can still just about make it out. A perfect pink triangle. Like an arrow pointing up my thigh. Can you see it? From a towel whipping, after rugby practice, when I was twelve. That's what they did, the boys, if you weren't one of them. The sadistic future judges and politicians, destined for their weekly doses of discipline from leather-clad, dead-eyed dominatrixes. And then I'd get home. You think you're a big shot, with your big words. Leave him alone. I don't know who he thinks he is these days. You were the ones who sent me to the school. I left school when I was 14. Leave him alone. You think you're better than me, is that it? Leave him alone. Will you stop saying that? He needs to learn. Oh, now look at him. Stop crying. You're making him cry. He needs toughening up. Leave him. Say that one more time, woman, and see what you get. I hate you. Oh, that's more like it. What else? Come on. What else? You're an angry idiot. Angry idiot? Hey. I wish you were dead. Do you know what, son? Sometimes I wish I was dead too. It's amazing how easy it is to catch fish. Up there. Right on the edge. Careful to avoid the lonely waves determined to drag you in. I'm getting sick of mackerel. Shame, because it used to be my favourite fish. On the boat, on the way, the keeper who picked me up from the port said, Espero que te gusta la caballa. I love mackerel, I said. For the benefit of the non-Spanish speakers, I'll translate the next bit. Look. He points down to the water's surface, melted glass swirling over shoals of darting silver fish. If you had a bucket, you could just scoop them up. Stupid as elephants fish, no sense of self-preservation. Don't they swim in shoals? Sharks to... don't swim in shoals. No, I suppose they don't. Want to get away from it all and experience a real adventure? It was a headline that felt as if it had been written for me. We're offering an opportunity for a hard-working, motivated individual to experience the getaway of a lifetime. Knowledge of basic Spanish and advantage. And it was basic, my Spanish. I had a Spanish girlfriend once. Didn't speak a word of English, and I didn't speak a word of Spanish at the time, but... Well, we made it work somehow. She came to stay at my house for the winter, while my landlady was on a tour of Afghanistan. In the early hours of a January morning, I woke to see her face accentuated by the street light coming in through the Venetian blinds. Snow, she said. And then she was gone, getting layered up in the hallway like a child preparing for its first experience of the white stuff, because it was her first time too. Don't they have snow in Spain, I said. But she was already out the door, into the crisp night, crunching across deserted roads, into the sugar-coated park to build a snowman make snowballs and eventually just lie in it. So I lay alongside her. You'll catch a chill. Unique snowflakes falling onto wide wandered eyeballs, melting into tears. If they're going to come here, they should at least learn the bloody language. And on the way back, giggling like idiots, we saw the milkman determined to do his duty. El hombre leche, she said. I've never forgotten that. I wonder what she's doing now. And why I let something as stupid as hairy armpits put me off a life with a girl my parents described as exotic.
It took me five days to get here. I hadn't even told anyone where I was going, so there were no awkward send-offs at the airport. Not that there was anyone to tell. First class. One way to Buenos Aires. Then overland by overnight buses, stopping at vivid towns in between to buy supplies, see the sights, and practice my Spanish. At least three times while sitting in town squares stroking stray dogs, I singled out beautiful girls and imagined meeting, falling in love with, and growing old with them. Once a family took pity on me and offered me a bed and some work on their farm, but it was too late for kindness. And anyway, I, I had somewhere to be. You'll never stick at anything. There was less work experience than I'd expected. He'd polish the lens, paint, make meals from the diminishing supplies, and I'd just sort of hang around. Reading, fishing, chopping vegetables, but mostly getting in the way. When he'd had a glass of wine in the evening, he'd tell stories of when he was a child and how he'd ended up here, tending a lighthouse on an island at the bottom of the world. You're the same age as my son would have been. He'd started to say that most nights, and most nights when I'd gone to bed, I could hear him somewhere, crying. And one morning he woke me. As he sat on the edge of my bed and the world started to come into focus, I looked into his bloodshot eyes. He put a hand on my shoulder. You have been a good son, he said. Thank you for coming so far to be with me. It's been the happiest time of my life. And he kissed me on the forehead, smiled and left. And that was the last time I saw him. I didn't worry until it started to get dark. He'd often disappear. Amazing how many places there are to hide in a lighthouse on an island in the middle of nowhere. But I was hungry, and I'd got used to him preparing the meals. Both he and the boat were gone, and when I came inside, I noticed he'd destroyed the radio and the satellite phone too. And that was fine with me. I'm having mackerel tonight, over an open fire. When the light starts to fade, I'll sit on the rocks and strain my eyes for distant signs of life. On a clear night, if I lie on my back, I can fool myself into believing I'm floating in space. In the brief moments between the light sweeping round across the water and beyond. Hello, Mum. Yeah, I'm fine. Good job I like fish. Is Dad there? No problem. Tell him I said hi. Yeah, of course I will. I'm a grown-up now, remember? Okay, I understand. Yeah, I miss you too. Good night. And every night after calling home, I close my eyes. Just for a moment. And that's when the dreams come. <laughs> I can't see you. You'll have to come and find me. But it's dark. Wait for the light to come around and look out. Look out as far as you can see and I'll be there waiting. Okay, hang on. Come. But I can't... Wait, y yes, I can see you. But you're so far away. Everything's going to be okay. That's what she told me. And now I'm here, talking to a mermaid, underneath a lighthouse, alone at the edge of the world. So you'll have to try harder than that. Wait! No, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to... Oh my god. I can see you. I can actually see you. Calm. It's all very well you saying that, but... From what I know of topless women beckoning men into the sea, things don't normally end well. I haven't got all night! Sorry? You heard? Well, yes, but... Look, are you coming in or not? You've got no idea of the amount of effort it takes to keep this tail flapping enough to keep my half-naked body out of the water. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Just make a decision. What? Come with you or stay here? Unless you have another offer. Right. Look. 
can you please come a bit closer so I don't have to shout? Mermaids don't really look good when they're shouting. Okay, but I'm not coming in just yet. Well, I can't come much closer without scratching my tail on the rocks, so it's up to you. If I come to the edge, you won't pull me in? No! You promise? This is not normally such hard work. Sorry, I'll come down now. Is that better? I'm assuming you're not really there anyway. Oh, really? Yeah, you're just a figment of my imagination. Or I'm dreaming. Give me your hand. Why are you talking like that? Like what? Give me your hand. Like that? It's habit, I suppose. It's fine. So what is it you want? What does any mermaid want? I don't know. To drag me down to the depths of the unforgiving ocean, only for my lungs to fill with salt water as I come to the realisation you were never really there. I bet you're fun at parties. When have you ever been to a party? We have parties. Oh yeah? And what do you do? I don't know. We dance. How can you dance without any legs? We sort of hover and wiggle our tails. Of course you do. And what do you dance to? Mermaid music. Yeah, it would be that, wouldn't it? And what does mermaid music sound like? All right, all right! Doesn't sound very danceable to me. It sounds different underwater. Really? Yeah. Jump in and I'll show you. I see what you're trying to do. I mean you no harm. Which is the first thing a creature from the deep would say if it could communicate and if it actually meant me harm. Creature? Yeah. That's hurtful. I can say what I like to you because you're not real. Reach out. If you want someone to reach out, you know, for future reference, maybe drop the creepy whispering in my head and just say it normally. Okay. <clears throat> reach out. I am so tempted. So do it. But I'll drown, and nobody will ever find my body, and, well, there are people who care about me who would at least like something to bury, you know, in the event that I do manage to survive. Just touch my hand. Why? I don't know. It's been a while, I suppose. Well, since you touched someone's hand. Yes. And that's all you want? Well, ideally a hug would be nice. At which point you squeeze the air out of my lungs and drag me down to the depths where I either get eaten by sharks or my bloated remains wash up on the beach of a remote island and I get pecked apart by famished seabirds. Or we just have a hug and then I swim you back to the rocks and you climb out, dry off and we're both happy. Come on. What have you got to lose? Like I said... You'll be fine. There will be a body to find and your parents will have something to bury. All I'm asking for is to hold your hand. Just for a moment. Come on. I'm just a lonely mermaid asking for a favour. Fine. Really? Yes. But you have to promise me... May Neptune run me through with his trident if I... It's fine. I believe you. So how do we do this? I'll reach out, then you reach out to touch my hand. Okay. After three. Oh, on three or after three? I don't know. Um, on three? Good. Thanks for this, by the way. It's fine. Such a refreshing change to actually be trusted. You're not helping. No, I'll shut up. Right, I'm ready when you are. Okay. One, two, three. Can't just lean a little closer. I'll fall in. You'll be fine. Okay, just a tiny bit. Almost there. Closer. No. Help. Please, please help me. Where are you? What were you thinking, you idiot? You can do this. You, you can, you can do this. Mum, Dad, I'm so... Uh, I'm so... If you're there, if you were real, please, please help! <gasps> Jesus! That was so... Never mind, think. 
get out of the wet clothes and start a fire. Think after. Yes, that, that's what I need to do, right? Matches. Where did I leave the matches? Thank you. Thank you, too. Right, matches. Wild Woman Wolf Child the Fourth by Jane Spur. This is a rant. I, Wild Woman Wolf Child the Fourth, wants to rant, so brace yourselves, my sweets, because I shall. Let us wolf. Let us break twigs together and try out a howl, shall us? After three. Well, that wasn't very good now, was it? Let's try again, shall us? You see that bright, round thing over there? Aim it at there! Arrgh! Yeah, that's it! Let it out! Keep going! Keep going! Howl it all up now! Let it out like we likes to! Be your own wolf. Remember though, no biting, especially here. And beware, beware you watchers from the village, you who stare. For underneath this comical woolly, what's that say about me and my stupid I don't think so hat? I have a fierce, fierce mind. And I've been hurt, see? Which makes me spiky as fuck. I'm given to sadness by too much remembering. Which makes me spiky as fuck. I likes giving people the evils afore they give them to me. See? Just feels good to glare. Ha! After all, I am Wild Woman, fourth in line to the wolf child throne. A roaring and a snarling and a snapping at your feckin' heels, come I. See me a swooping down through roundy top fields with wind in me hair and dishes in the sink. Let em soak. Just watch me howl, boy. Watch me howl. Howling at me zero hour contract. Ripping off them flipping greasy rubber gloves with me teeth. Howling at me ever mounting bills. Ringing out the mop, ringing it hard. Do floor, do it again. Haven't hardly no time to run with my kin, my pack. To be my wild woman wolf child the fourth, even in secret. Only in the car and between jobs, too swamped in sweaty, poured knackeredness to ever bloody well stop to think about changing any fucking thing. Endure I must, endure I will, like granite, tough, sparkly, hard. Hammer the fuck out of it, but it will still be there. Impenetrable's the word. A long word. I heard it on a TV quiz. You gotta keep on keeping on, else you is lost, see? Twixt harvest and the full moon tide, born was I, queen of the hedge, I likes to think. A weaver of dreams, sleeps and weeds, herstories from way aback a when, when times was full of blood and beasts and birds and monsters, us as always moved silent like, waiting, waiting to pounce. Yeah, even me with this dammy leg moves silent like, believe it or not. Only the merest glint of fire in me watchful eye will let you know you have, in the dimpsiest reaches of the dusk, behind yonder tree, espied me. Shush. Shush. The olds would look up at them stars while carving their initials into the bark, knowing their secret would be forever. She wolf, him more. He took her name. Thus, wild woman wolf child was born tangled in thorns and yelling and screaming, running through fields and streams, hunted and hunting. She grows up quick like, no one ever noticing, hidden under her hat, her fight savaged ear. FYI, wolves like us see, we likes everyday things like big old sweater tops, wolfy ones with full moons on, no fur showing. Because then, no one knows we're a this till we choose to tell them, of course. So for now, it's just me and you, honorary wolves, out there if you want to. I mean, no one's forcing you. Take it or leave it. It makes no difference to me. And no one ever guesses when we go to the shops and car boots and the like that I am part creature. And no one knows. As I clean they lots, whitewashed, open-plan kitchen, friggin' wet room walk-through, four-before, bifocal doored chalet. And as I take out the rattly old champagne bottles, no one knows that it's a wolf in women's clothing that is scrubbing away inside of their precious, highly sought-after coastal property that used to be a plain old bungalow. Where are them bin bags? Can't reverse down that lane, though, can you, Mr and Mrs Goddamn Minted? And it dawns on me, then, 
like a ray of light through me crystal dingle dangle on the dash, whilst I wait for them to reverse, turning down me blary wolf music. I turn it back up when they pass and the rat run is clear again. Get on. It occurs to me then, with the wind blowing me hair all over the shop, that at least I'm skilled in a couple of things in this old world. Howling, reversing and feeling frustrated. And this, this is where the cider helps, see? So I get out my fuck austerity mug and I drinks from it. Because when all the packet, the wad shrinks as if by wolfy magic, I get desperate, see? Like when I'm thirsty. Where is me water? Give me that bottle. Rinse, rinse, splashbacks. And now we've run out of bloody bleach. But all gets calm again for a while. When I picks me money up, spendy, spend, spend till it's all gone. Just a few pennies in the bottom of me purse. But they ain't forgotten for long. Me woes, that is, me woes and be tides. So I'm going to write my best wild woman wolf child the fourth protest song. Yeah. And sing it loud up to that great mother in the skies. And maybe, just maybe, someone's ear out there in the great cosmos will hear it. And it will stick and chime with their insides, yeah? A bit like a girly grandfather clock. Ticky top, wolfy style like. And something will work for me for once. Just don't get me started on wolfy politics, okay? Just don't. And, 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 and before you start a judging, I voted poor, all right? Put a feckin' great paw print all over the flimsy piece of shit. So put that in your peace pipe and vape it. Arroo, arroo, arroo. Where's mine gone? Keep howling now. Howl your dog's guts up if you want to. Yeah, that's good. Where is that water to? Let me drink. Dear God, let me drink more and more, and let me dig deep in the earth, rooting through the damp moss under me nails, burrowing in the musky soil. What, wild woman wolf child? Sad? Whatever can be the matter? Has the computer says no to the wolf loan? What? Oh, dearie me, well, fuck them forms. The questions, the forms, the more questions, and the computer still says no. Lovely, now it's frozen. Wondering if I'm the only bitter and twisted wild woman wolf child in this whole wide world load of cobwebs. Probably am. Poor me, eh? Poor little old me. <clears throat> so as I keeps me wolfy wad under the bed now, I mean, I'm no expert, what in the hell do I know? I'm no goddamn banker's bonus expert with a degree in bloody bullshit or number jumbling, but get this, I can make a great pasty. And yeah, oh yeah, and 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 if you ignore me, I can ignore you back double like, no returns forever like a standing stone. So there, that's telling you. And all the goddamn money in the universe can't buy that. Oh yeah, and I do have a nose that can smell lies and stuff. Oh, for fuck's sake, I give up. What? Give up what? Moaning? And the fucks and the for fuck's sakes? Yeah, yeah, bet you can't. Can so? Shit. Note to self, try not to say that either. Ha! Ah, shit to it. My wild woman, Wolf Child the Fourth, would she give a damn? No, she bloody well wouldn't. Did you hear unemployments for wolves, my sweets, is at a new all time low? Not down here, lovey. Open your eyes. Us is scrabbling under the radar. It's all about the living rage down here. Yeah. Empty the bins. Water. Let me wash me chops. Fresh and cool. Shut me eyes and I'm covered in ferns. Ivy clad. Resting me head on a bed of leaves. Neath the pines so tall and listening to the whispers of the gone befores. Ha. Huh. But enough of this. This moan fest, enough. So, welcome. Look, you lot, come on in. Don't you worry, they won't know you've been here. Put the kettle on, but just make sure you wipe your feet first, you. I don't want you treading muck round the place. I just cleaned it. Woman Wolf Child the Fourth by Jane Spur. Samantha Lund was Wild Woman Wolf Child. 
The director was Helen Gilbert. The editor was Alex Robbins. Produced by Downstage Write as part of Write Up, supported by Arts Council England. For more information, visit www.downstagewrite.uk.